This video is about the impulse function. It's not really a learning objective, but it's some background mathematical information that you need to know. Hopefully you've had this in another class, but if not, this video is designed to fill in some gaps. The impulse function exists in both discrete and continuous forms. We use the Greek letter delta when we're talking about the impulse function. And when we're talking about a discrete function, any type of discrete function, just like we've the rest of the course, we use square brackets and letter n. This particular discrete function has a value of 1 when n is 0 and a value of 0 when n is not equal to 0. Like any other discrete function, when we draw it, we draw it as a stem plot. So it has an amplitude of 1 when n is 0, an amplitude of 0 at other values of n. If we scale this function, then the amplitude gets scaled by 3 and becomes 3. It still only occurs at time 0, so we then would also scale our plot. We could also shift our function, in which case our argument is now n minus 2, so our argument would then be n minus 2 equals 0, and that occurs when n is equal to 2, and it's 0 when n is not equal to 2 all the other times. This amplitude is still 1. The continuous impulse function is a little bit different. We still use the letter delta when we're talking about it, and as with all continuous functions, we use round brackets and the letter t when we're talking about a continuous function. Something is happening when t is equal to 0, when the argument is equal to 0. But now instead of having an amplitude of 1, we have an amplitude of infinity. It's 0 everywhere else, but it have an amplitude of infinity at time 0. We draw that as an arrow indicating something that's going all the way up to infinity. But because we have a finite amount of paper, we don't draw it all the way up to infinity. Make sure you note that we draw it with an arrow, and we don't draw it with a round circle when we're talking about it. This one that's next to it is there to describe its area, because the area under a continuous impulse function is 1. All this area occurs under this arrow. Everywhere else it has an amplitude of 0, and that also has an area of 0 here. But our area is 1, and we indicate that it was a 1. Again, very important, this 1 is the area, not the amplitude. So let's think about that area sum. If we were to take the area and integrate from minus 5 to minus 2, how much area do we have there? Because amplitude is always 0, I hope you came up with the fact we had the area of 0. Now let's think about the area between negative 2 and positive 2. That region includes this arrow, therefore it includes that area of 1. Even though we're not going up from minus infinity to positive infinity, we are integrating where the area is occurring, therefore the area is 1. When we integrate from 2 to 5, we're again integrating just places where the amplitude is 0, so therefore our area will also be 0. Let's consider the case where we're now going to integrate our impulse function, but we're going to integrate it with the dummy variable tau, and we're going to integrate it from minus infinity up to some value t, and that value of t is going to vary. So let's think about that. If we integrate from minus infinity up to where the arrow is pointing right now, how much area do we have? Zero. If we integrate up to here, how much area do we have? Still zero. If we integrate up to here, how much area do we have? Still zero. But as soon as we're integrating from negative infinity up to here, right after that arrow, the amount of area we have is that one. And we're going to have one if we integrate from minus infinity up to here, minus infinity up to here, minus infinity up to here. For all those values, we get an area of 1. Therefore, we have an area of 1 if t is greater than or equal to 0, because that's when we're integrating up and including that 1. And we have an area of 0 if we're integrating just up to a place less than 0. Now, you've seen that function before. What is that? That's our unit step function. So the integral from minus infinity to t, delta of tau d tau, is our unit step function. Notice this has an integral up to t. As in we saw before, 
If we're integrating from minus infinity up to positive infinity, our area is 1. Here we're integrating up from minus infinity up to t. So our area is a step function. It's not always 1, it's only 1 for positive t. Related to integration, the opposite function from integration is differentiation. So if we know that the integral from minus infinity to t of delta of tau d tau is the step function, what do you think is the derivative of our step function? It's our impulse function. You need to know these. We're going to use it quite a bit in this course. Related to impulse functions, there are two theorems that apply. One of them we're going to talk about here. I call it the no-name theorem because nobody's ever given a name in any literature I've read, and I want to have some way of communicating with you what we're talking about when I'm referencing this particular theorem. The other theorem you need to know, you're going to learn in Learning Outcome 2.3, and that's the sifting theorem. Watch the video for Learning Outcome 2.3. We'll talk about that. In the meantime, the no-name theorem is when we take our impulse function, shift it to an arbitrary location t0, and multiply it by any function f of t. That function can be any arbitrary function. I've just drawn something here for an example. When we do that, if we're taking the function for time less than t0, all our impulse function here is 0. 0 times anything is going to be 0. When we're looking at time greater than t0, we, our impulse function is also 0. 0 times any function f of t there will also be 0. So this product will be 0 when we're not equal to t0. When we are equal to t0, we only have to worry about our function at that one point. And therefore, our function only matters at that one point. And that's going to be a scalar value, and that scalar value is going to scale our impulse function just like the 3 scaled it in the previous example. Again, the no-name theorem is we take our impulse function, shift to anywhere, it's multiplied by any arbitrary function. It's going to be that same impulse function at the same location, but it's now scaled by a constant. Changing that to a constant means you can move it outside of differentiation and integration. You can apply other linearity properties to it, and that's very, very helpful.